I made a request at the end of last week's episode for more feedback, and I just want to thank all of you who took the time to reach out. Um, I got a lot of positive feedback, people telling me they really enjoyed the podcast. Um, some friends of mine that know me personally, but also people who I've never met before that have found me through different avenues. So thanks for reaching out and giving me some positive encouragement and also some constructive criticism, not really criticism, but just some pointers of like one person said that the audio on my YouTube channel was too low. He had to turn it up all the way. Stuff like that's super helpful. So if you guys, anyone else wants to reach out, let me know how I'm doing. If you're really enjoying it or if there's little things you think could be better, could be improved. Uh, reach out. One of the best ways is just DM me on Instagram at Chronicles of a Psychonaut on Instagram. So thanks for that. And I just wanted to mention, uh, you guys may have noticed that I don't run ads on my podcast. And that's because I find ads to be annoying and I don't want them in my podcast um, as much as possible. At some point, I may have to figure out a way for the podcast to make money. But at this point, I'm having fun with it as just a hobby. Uh, there, the podcast hosting platforms have an option to automatically monetize your podcast. And what they do is they'll, throughout the episode, they'll automatically cut in an ad, which I think is the most annoying thing ever when I'm listening to podcasts. I hate that. Uh, so I don't do that. But... Um, one friend suggested that I start a Patreon or just an avenue for donations. So um, I'm going to do that before I release this episode. So I'll put that link in the description. So, and you know, this is free to listen to. And I, if you guys don't have to donate at all, but I, if you want to, it helps because um, there is a monthly cost for me to host this and put this on. So yeah, you know, even if you sign up for like whatever, any small amount, everything helps. So I appreciate that. And also I want to let you guys know about um, a crystal store that I have on Etsy. I sell crystals, jewelry, gemstones, and I also sell shamanic tools. Like I just got a new batch of um, rattles in from Peru. They're made by the Shipibo people down there who are one of the main tribes that do the ayahuasca tradition. And they're made out of little gourds. I should, I'm on video right now on YouTube, If in case you're watching, I should have one here to show you, but I, maybe I'll put it in the outro. Um, so yeah, check out my store. I have a lot of cool stuff on there. You can find it also, the link is in the description, or go to Etsy, E-T-S-Y, Etsy.com slash shop slash infinity within that's the name of my store infinity within and um yeah check it out i have cool stuff on there one of my favorite stones is moldavite if you don't know what moldavite is it's a crystal that was created from a meteorite impact and there's been tens of thousands of meteorites that have hit the earth that we've found evidence for over geologic time over millions of years found the craters and the evidence for them. But there's only one meteorite impact that made this particular kind of stone called moldavite. And it's crystalline and it's green. It's really cool looking. And um, it's 15 million years old. And we've found it. It's It comes from basically the Czech Republic. Uh, there's a giant 15 mile w wide crater in Germany where this struck way before humans came along. And when humans came along, they actually built a town inside of this crater. And it's not a deep crater, it's it's 15 miles wide. It's it's definitely a crater, but it's so subtle, you can't even really tell, it's basically a depression in the ground. But people came along and they, they built a town in there and they had no idea that they were inside of a meteorite crater until fairly recently, they figured this out. Um, there's a thing called shocked quartz, and that's one of the signs of a meteorite impact. It's just that tremendous impact when it hits quartz, it leaves a very particular kind of um, 
marker or um, it's a particular phenomenon unique to meteorites. So anyway, there's there's all kinds of cool stuff on there. So check that out. So today's episode features a very good friend of mine, Halo Saranko, and we talked about the Tantric Path. Now, in Western society, most people have heard of Tantra, but what most people think of in Tantra is they think of it as sex, that that's Tantra is sex or Tantra is a, a, a deeper sexual practice. Um, and that is one aspect of Tantra. But as Halo will explain to us, Tantra is really more of a path of awakening. And Tantra is about embracing all, all of the aspects of life and human experience, sexuality being one of them. And um, I find that Tantra has a beautiful perspective on sexuality uh, in contrast to a lot of other paths that deny sexuality, religions that deny sexuality or feel shame around it. And Tantra embraces sexuality as an aspect of who we are. And it goes well beyond sexuality into all of the different aspects that we are. And there's many practices that help you deepen into yourself. And so we talk about the tantric path and we also just talk about happiness and how basically that's what all of us seek. And we all have our ways of trying to be happy. And many of those ways are not successful. Um, like for example, we don't, like pain. We don't like to feel bad. We don't like to hurt. So what do we do with that? Well, sometimes we try and get away from our pain or numb to our pain or hide from our pain in order to be happy. That's a, we're, we're seeking happiness, but it turns out that actually ultimately does not work. It's an ineffective strategy. So we go deeper into that. And this is what I like to call shadow work is like doing well, not just me, it's called shadow work, but that's how I refer to it as well. And yeah, we just had an incredibly rich and deep conversation. So I hope you enjoy it. In the very beginning of the episode, we throw a lot of information at you. So it's like pretty fast pace, but just try and try and stay with us. And uh, we settle in, we ground in a little bit more towards the middle and, and towards the end. And yeah, we had a beautiful conversation, so enjoy. I'm really excited to have you here today, Halo. We've talked about doing an episode for a long time. So thanks for joining me. My absolute pleasure. So I wanted to talk to you about Tantra because this is a path that you've studied extensively, I think more than anyone else that I know. Mm -hmm. And it's such a deep and powerful path and it's something that seems very misunderstood in the West. Um, I know when most people hear Tantra, they think of sex. And there is a sexual practice associated with Tantra, but it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'd love to just, I'm excited to hear your perspective on it. And first off, um, do you have you found a way to kind of as a just preliminary explanation what is tantra <laughs> i know do, i know how do i put the do. ocean into a paper cup you yeah mean? yeah um i do i do uh i mean it might be a little bit larger than a nutshell but oh we'll, um, we'll get into yeah, that but. totally totally um tantra in general so yeah there is this um i call it nouveau tantra and 
even that's not exactly accurate the the sexual tantra it's it's more like sacred sexuality which i think is really powerful and beautiful and i love that tantra is at least becoming a gateway for people to have more beautiful intimate experiences and deeper richer uh, more sacred intimate experiences with each other however to use the word tantra in that context whatsoever is actually not totally appropriate and um, we'll get deeper into that what the actual sexual practices in the tantric system were or are Um, but just to start what is tantra as a system tantra is actually a science of awakening right so it goes so far our sexuality is a part of that and i think the reason that sexuality got so involved with tantra is that Tantra is one of the few um, philosophies. It's not a religion. (laughs) It's a philosophy. And more, even more accurately, like I said before, it's a science. So what is a science, right? It's a tried and true method to achieve particular results. Mm -hmm. And so with Tantra, the result that we are trying to uh, achieve is complete awakening into unity right so sex can be a part of that there's no aspect of humanity within the tantric view that um, can't potentially lead us to full awakening right so that's the beautiful thing where so many kind of religions and different systems kind of um, either negate suppress or distort sexuality finally we find something that actually includes it and honors it also as a path to that state of supreme consciousness and awakening in the body, not in negation to. So in a nutshell, (laughs) it's like, yeah, a whole wormhole that we'll dive down today. But in a nutshell, Tantra is the science of awakening into the truth of who we are. Okay. And well, the first thing comes to mind is who are we? (laughs) (laughs) yes who are we well um, and is that is that something that the tantric path speaks to is like what are we awakening into Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um i think first i want to say that just the question who am i you know without needing an answer can already lead us to an answer to some degree Right. There's a lot of meditation, especially if we go into a different system that's related to Tantra. If we go into Advaita Vedanta, um, that's their primary practice is basically sitting for hours a day asking yourself the question, who am I? And the goal of this is to get beyond uh, all the masks. So in in Tantra, we call it Maya and it's actually a a name of the goddess so it's not something the goddess being shakti which we'll get more into uh, as we go Um, maya is means illusion and it's not necessarily a negative thing right it's an expression of the goddess but she lays all these kind of veils before us some of them being uh, you know one of the the predominant being our ego or this i sense but this I sense comes from being, um, you know, I am a this. It's, it's based on what we do. It's based on our gender. And so w- who we are uh, in, in many spiritual systems, not just in Tantra, when we're trying to look for the true self, we're trying to get beyond all of our ego identifications of who we are mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and who others think we are, you mm-hmm. know, and the idea is that you know we're kind of walking in a hall of mirrors right there are all these different uh, expressions and appearances and we're projecting our own (laughs) ray into that hall of mirrors right Mm. and so there's subject and object there's duality Um, none of this that we're experiencing could exist without duality right because there has to be a subject and object for there to be an experience there has to be time and space for there to be a container for us to be experiencing within so so who are we in any spiritual system pretty much anyone you know some got distorted along the way but the roots of all spiritual traditions has to do with this innate sense that there's something larger than us here 
right? There's something more mysterious, more miraculous, uh, something that can't honestly be contained in words even, which is why Tantra is so flowery and artistic in its expression of this, right? Because Mm -hmm. words can't really do it justice. But if we are to put it into words, (laughs) um, we're trying to go the truth. We're trying to find the true self in going beyond duality into like, what's the common thread that unites all things? Well, there's this, there's this consciousness, there's this animated uh, witness within us that is aware of all of these things. We can all get into um, these meditative states where we feel, or even sometimes through use of psychedelics, You know, there's all different ways that we attain this where we feel how we are interwoven with the entirety of the fabric of creation. So we're basically trying to lens out from like the ego is like has a very small like view on on what is right. Mm -hmm. But if we lens way, way, way out and we start to see that we are everything who we are is actually not limited at all, even though we're in bodies, right? Even though we have a personality. So, so who are we? Um, I think ultimately remains a question to the true spiritual seeker on whatever path we choose, whether it's Tantra or something else. Um, but the idea is that it's something much, much larger than these little ideas we have. And so the safety net that that is is that who we think we are, this body, this person who's having this particular life, will die. It's transient. It's just a a wave on the crest of the ocean that will become a part of the ocean again, right? Mm -hmm. You know, how important am I if I'm just like a wave that's going to crest and then be gone, never to be seen again, right? Well, but I think that freaks a lot of people it out. It freaks a lot of people out. And it is freaky. It's like, whoa, what's really important? And I think that's what's beautiful about these conversations and these traditions. It's like, there's something bigger than that. What do we go? What do we arise out of and go back into? That's the question, right? Mm. Almost all spiritual systems are based on uh, what I call the great mystery. Because it's mysterious, this realm that we come into. And it's even more mysterious, the realm that we go into next. And so most of these traditions are trying their sciences of exploring that. And um, the more we observe nature and the cosmos in which the mystery reveals itself, um, the more we can start to, and the more, not even uh, the outer aspects, but the more we also go inside and explore the inner space, we start to see patterns and and ways things are. And we observe duality, for example, through the sun and the moon, right? Um, There's so many clues within us and outside of us to that larger context, right? And so what we're searching for in who we are is the through line. It's not what comes and goes, the transient. We're trying to find the eternal. And there is an aspect of creation that is the eternal. And uh, in Tantra specifically, we relate that to the deity Shiva, who is the masculine counterpart, although I'll get more into this. Um, And he represents pure consciousness. So, um, So, yeah, that's... (laughs) <laughs> it's it's a that's a that's like the hardest question to answer and honestly sure. if I'm i sure. if i were a guru i might have a more flowery way of explaining it but that's what i got <laughs> yeah wow that's a lot um th- no that was beautiful um there's so much to there's so many different avenues to go from there yeah um i guess let's talk let's break that down and let's talk more about duality Mm -hmm. and unity because this is something that is very common to spiritual traditions. Mm -hmm. It's also something that I haven't quite talked about on the podcast yet. So yeah, let's go into it. My favorite subject. Really? Cool. (laughs) Well, that's what got me into the tantric system. Mm -hmm. Um, Is this reality of duality? So, um, yeah, we are living in a, a an experience of duality, right? You know. But I guess, like, 
I want to break it down even further because, well, people who are in involved in spirituality may be familiar with the, this concept of duality and unity mm -hmm. or the archetypes of such. But I know a lot of people maybe aren't, or maybe mm -hmm. they've heard of it on the periphery of them. Right. And so, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory in a way, like duality is, are basically the poles, mm -hmm. like masculine and feminine, they're, they're opposites. And I mean, I feel very drawn to the Taoist path and mm -hmm. Taoism is about yeah. the, the middle road. And I'm interested to hear the tantric perspective as well. But I, I've always thought about duality and, and the poles of duality as teachers. Mm -hmm. And that like we live in this this dualistic world of of good and bad and right and wrong and man and woman. And there's all of these poles. But the challenge is to find the balance point in between the extremes. And yes that the poles and the duality serves to teach us to find the balance point within and duality exists externally, but it also exists internally. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the internal dualism is more difficult to become aware of. It's a lot easier to see it in the out external yeah. world, but yeah. more difficult to perceive and balance say the masculine and feminine within say mm -hmm. the right and wrong within mm -hmm. and to really assess and get a sense of where am I with that you know like at least when you're still in in the, the I phase of things right. like you know when I'm just sitting and meditating in my and doing my practice just just getting a sense of where am I and and how can I bring aspects of myself into greater balance yeah absolutely so in both the i guess what i feel is that within tantra and in in the taoist path um you know there's the yin yang symbol for example mm -hmm. it it very clearly portrays duality mm -hmm. and yet if you take the symbol of the yin and yang, which is not a static symbol, and you spin it, all of a sudden it blurs. Duality mm -hmm. blurs into one, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's the same in the tantric system, kind of the example of, of that symbol would be the Sri Yantra, is the one people are most familiar with. And that is um, five downward facing triangles representing the feminine principle and four upward facing triangles representing the masculine principle. And they are creating this big web of um, what is <laughs> essentially everything can be explained within the symbol of the yin and yang. Everything can be explained within the symbol of the Sri Yantra, right? It's, it's, here's what's so important about duality. And I think it's, so as we go in these paths, it's like we want to transcend duality. I think more than transcend it, we want to alchemize it. We want to use duality. So that's what these systems do, both the Tao and the Tantra. They use duality as a gateway into one, into unity, into mm -hmm. that middle path, right? They're like signposts on the road mm -hmm. that, in, that inform you. Yeah, and they're the two forces that we work with. I mean, we directly work with, um, in the Tantric system, it's called Purusha and Prakriti. And Purusha represents uh, that pure consciousness, right? So that unchanging, what is it that's actually looking out of these eyes, right? Mm -hmm. What's actually looking out of those eyes? It's the same thing, according to Tantra, mm -hmm. right? It's the same, just pure consciousness. Before it starts to have these layers of masks and personality, mm -hmm. they call those the koshas, the, the different um, bodies. So there are five koshas in the system you know our first is the body the anamaya kosha right so this is our first place of identity Physi right physical body mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. these are sheaths that we wear around that pure consciousness that's inside of ourself right so the first is the anamaya kosha then we have the pranamaya kosha which is the energy 
that flows in and around our body right mm -hmm. so that's the next thing like all of our energy is flowing a little bit differently we have different experiences because of that then we have the manumaya kosha which is the mind so now our mind brings even more differentiation this is where our ego comes in right so first we all have a different body we all have different energetic flows within that body and outside that body we all have you know the personality is probably the biggest thing now we're in the, the mind right then we have the vijnana maya kosha which is um the wisdom so like our intuition so we're getting closer and closer right so that the the, the anamaya kosha the body is the densest part of us right so we're getting more and more subtle as we go which means we're getting closer and closer to that indwelling um consciousness mm. indwelling and out like everywhere dwelling <laughs> omnipresent omnipotent mm -hmm. omni everything um so from the vijnana maya kosha which is, is like the realms of intuition um our higher self like if you've ever been in one of those situations where your mind is like rah, 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 and your higher self like all of a sudden there's this other part of you that's kind of like huh that's interesting that you're doing this right now like I wonder what's going on for you, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Have you ever had that experience? Mm -hmm. That's the Vigyana Maya Kosha coming in, this like higher self, but it's still a differentiated self, right? And so then from that, we go into the Ananda Maya Kosha, and this is the bliss body. And so this is our first, when I talk about bliss, I'm not talking about sexual, you know, pleasure, indulgent through the body pleasure. Yeah. Right. I'm talking about something way, way, way larger. So when we tap into our Anandamaya Kosha, our bliss body, this is like we are now in union. It's no longer a sexual union. You know, the, the draw of sex, I'm bringing it back to that uh, angle on Tantra. The draw of sex is that um, as a woman, like I am hungry for the masculine or it could be the same sex but either way there's a polar play happening right mm -hmm. um so i'm hungry for opposite right to complete now what happens when we activate the bliss body is that something so much larger something already complete because like downloads into us it's like this wave of bliss and nectar on the journey of awakening which i'll talk about what that looks like as we go um and all of a sudden we feel it's it's like there's kind of a death. You know, I've had experiences of this, but I'm not, you know, I'm not an awakened being. I'm still working through my layers, but I've been studying this science. Mm -hmm. So what I believe happens <laughs> is that, you know, we go through a little death, like those smaller aspects of self have to kind of die to make way for something so much larger like they literally can't handle the frequency that is about to come through but then we become one with everything that is it's like you know the sex is very limited it's like my body and another person's body and you know our personalities coming together whatnot but this is like all of a sudden i am in that same kind of union but it's so far beyond physical it's with everything that is everything that was everything that will be like we just become time and space itself we become omnipresent we become um we become everything hmm. yeah so we go from the idea of duality is is separation separation is inherent in duality right mm -hmm. i'm sitting here you're sitting there we're separate you're a man i'm a woman separate you know, and we can separate, separate, separate. You know, I see a lot of this um, happening right now, especially in planet Earth. There's a really big energy towards separation based on people's skin color, based on people's sexual orientation, based on people's gender, based on people's religion. Like we are obsessed with separation right now. So what happens when we go back into unity, when we recognize that it is the same consciousness that's looking out of every single sentient being's eyes you know and that i feel is the world that we're all trying to awaken into mm -hmm. and the idea with tantra is that it's already here and we just need to awaken through these different veils that the goddess shakti who is energy and form uh places before us <laughs> right mm -hmm. so that's what's important about duality and um so i explained purusha 
Uh, t- speaking of Shakti, I want to go a little bit into what Prakriti is. So Prakriti is now the feminine principle. Well, before uh, we go on, yeah. So I want to, I guess like I'm just thinking like for some people this is probably like so foreign, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. And also like I want to acknowledge too that there's there are a lot of these similar or same concepts in new age culture. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, I want to make sure that we really differentiate between the the system of Tantra that you're talking about, which is like ancient, like one of the oldest traditions known, if not the oldest, correct? One of the oldest for sure. One of the oldest, thousands of years old. Very old. And new age culture is pretty new and I just want to differentiate between like some of these concepts like duality and unity and this Mm -hmm. this idea that like we are all one and there's this consciousness that is looking through your eyes and through my eyes and that that, that's the same and that's the deeper meaning of the word namaste yeah is that it is that consciousness that consciousness in me recognizes that consciousness in you it's it's an acknowledgement of the the unity of beingness that you and I are and that all of us belong to. And that's an incredibly deep and powerful concept. And there, these things can be, these concepts can be thrown, thrown around in such a frivolous manner that they can sort of lose that depth. And I mean, like we're just talking about people's idea of the concept of Tantra and how Mm -hmm. it's just about sex or people's idea of yoga and just going and doing a vinyasa class and, oh, you're doing yoga. But I think there's, there's a missing link between some of the words of these concepts and the words that people speak about them or even the thoughts they think about them and then the deeper understanding. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah. I, I just want to, like, before we go on, I just want to acknowledge that too, that like we're talking about unity, we're talking about this oneness, but we're talking also about like an, 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 an ancient system that acknowledges this. And like, I want to make sure that we like really sink into the depth of like what that means so yeah. that it comes across, you know, because yeah. to some casual listener who maybe doesn't know about this, you know, and I don't know, maybe this is just like my, my personal process too, is I find spirituality difficult to talk about at times because how frivolous it is in the broader culture mm-hmm. that it, it can be just difficult to speak about something in a way, knowing that people's ears are like jaded. My ears are jaded in a way of just hearing people just be like, Oh, well, we're all one anyway. And I'm just like, yeah, but, but there is such a depth and power to some of these traditions and even just our, our own individual experience, like whether we're on a spiritual path or not, everyone's having a powerful experience. Yeah. Especially Mm -hmm. in these times. Yeah. Yeah, I think the first thing I'll say to that is that, um, you know, again, Tantra being a science, talk is cheap. We can talk, I can talk all day about the concepts of spirituality. What the science is, is the, is, is a formula to have the actual direct embodied experience of these concepts that I'm like just talking about right now. And that. It was always the appeal to me of Eastern traditions as Mm -hmm. opposed to Western religious traditions Yeah, is it's not purely faith based where it's like, okay, all you have to do is believe in your Lord and Savior and you're saved. And, um, you know, all, all you have to do is accept that this is the truth. And I, I just always had a hard time with that. I'm like, gosh, that sounds great, but. I mean, how can I believe, just believe in God? Like, I want to know, I want to have an experience Gnosis. of God. Gnosis, exactly. And you can. G-N-O-S-I-S. Yes, Gnosis. that Gnosis. And 
you know, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? We can read lots of books. We can gain lots of knowledge. Wisdom comes from actually embodying, experiencing. And in these traditions, they're basically like, you don't know like Jack if you haven't actually had the direct experience of it. Like that's the only way we can actually know truth. Right. So also on the spiritual path, we're seeking truth. Like what is real? Because my God, especially in this day and age, it's like, oh my God, what's happening right now on this planet? I don't believe hardly anything anymore. Right. You know? And that's the best place to start. Mm hmm. We are the testing grounds. Our lives are the school. Like I, that's how I look at, you know, tantric system or not. It's, it's like, we're all in this mysterious unfolding. Like what the heck is this body? Like who, what are, where are these words even coming from right now? Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very mysterious. And so we have to first enter these symptoms or symptoms, systems. That was an interesting one. Um, we have to enter these systems from a place of not knowing or our cup isn't empty enough to receive true mm -hmm. gnosis, mm -hmm. right? And so I think this is what I see happening a lot in the West is that people, you know, take like a three-day workshop and then they know something. And it's like, it takes time, you know, especially this tradition. I've had my own, I still go through hurdles where I'm like, do I really have what it takes to walk down this path? Because you know, for the science to really work, you know, we're basically like rewiring our entire system, the body, the energy, the mind, the, like all of those different levels of, of bodies mm -hmm. that I explained earlier. We're trying to rewire all of that. Re and it, rewire how? Like in, in what, in what way? Like, in, and like, just give me kind of more concrete, like where... For in your experience, like where are you starting at or or and then where are you going to like what does yeah. that rewiring look like? Great question. So um, here's the here's the beauty of Tantra and here's why it's taken such a strong foothold in the West um, as it is <laughs> in, in the sacred sexuality world, especially is that Tantra begins wherever you're at, like wherever you're at. Whatever you're coming into, that's where you begin. That's what's so beautiful about this system is it's it's not, I want to speak a little bit. I want to go back to some of the stuff you were saying about Western religions. And um, I don't believe personally in my studies, I don't believe any religions actually started from the place of, you know, you need to just trust in God. Even Christianity right. started with like, know thyself, like n understand who you actually are, you know, and, and Jesus was an example. He was a living example. That's how, you know, in the tantric system, a guru initiates a disciple simply by being, they're not like talk, talk, talking like I am right now. It's like they're transmitting. There's a difference in learning when we have someone talking at us then when we have someone transmitting the actual results of like a, that word again gnosis there's something so there's something that i feel when i'm in the i've never mm -hmm. necessarily been in the presence of a guru per se but there are, like i i went to um see adya shanti speak mm -hmm. in santa cruz years ago um and i've just been around people who have cultivated themselves spiritually they've spent a lot of time uh in the personal growth process a lot of time meditating and there's something about these people that i feel there's mm -hmm. there's a feeling an experience yes. of them and yeah they're they speak words you know like he he sat up and and adi shanti did uh spoke for however long hour right. hour and a half but really there was like a palpable experience of right. him that and those was words much hit more, you deeper than right right and that's the difference between i mean somebody else could have like you know let's say they they recorded his talk somebody else could have memorized that talk and gone up and said the exact same words and but not had not been transmitting it from that place of yes. like knowingness and wisdom and it wouldn't carry the same impact, at least for me. Like that's something that I always look for and is that feeling. There's a, it's hard to describe too, like what is that feeling? It's That's not something I can necessarily put into words, but 
I I know that they're speaking from like an integrated place of of yeah. wisdom and it's not just these words and concepts that sound good and that are appealing to people yeah um and it's also like the way that these people speak it's not like it kind of flows out of them in a way like there isn't a lot of mind and analysis it's just like they open and then they share these things yeah. is the best way I can kind of describe. Yeah. Describe that. Absolutely. But then you're also talking about a transmission, which can happen with wordlessly as it well. It can happen with words. It can happen without words. But what you're speaking of is exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. And that feeling that you're, you're mentioning, I refer to as ringing the bell. Mm -hmm. Like when something resonates for me, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I'm not just going to take anything anyone says. Right. If it strikes a chord deep in my being as truth, like I feel like my truth meter is this little internal bell. And if something rings the bell, like I feel like there's a feeling, there's like a resonance. What is resonance? If you've ever played a singing bowl, it's like, wah, wah, you know, like that kind of radiates out inside of me when someone speaks truth or I have a direct experience while I'm listening to them of what they're speaking of. So this is how you know a good, a, a true master. Yeah. Um, and I found that for me, I had to go undergo a process of calibrating that mm -hmm. truth meter. Yes. That, I mean, yeah. because basically our culture, American culture, Western culture is incredibly mind-based. And I mean, we really don't even acknowledge the intuition. We don't acknowledge the pranic body or energy body. We, I, like, we're still kind of operating off of this Newtonian mechanistic view of that mm -hmm. we're these f flesh bags and, <laughs> you know, that there's this random me mechanistic operation to the world. Um, there isn't an acknowledgement of the greater, those, those, those more subtle realms and levels mm -hmm. which i feel well i know because i've experienced them like i when i talk about them and sometimes through psychedelic experience um spoken about that on this podcast before but also not necessary it, this th those are not necessary like psychedelics are a tool they can open that experience to a person for a limited time but really like those experiences are not hallucinations associated with those plants. Like those are real um, experiences of consciousness that can be achieved without any, you know, external drug or plant or anything. Right. And they can be achieved through cultivation um, with the help of some of these ancient traditions that like people figured this out they yeah. figured out these specific methods of like if you want to get deeper into yourself if you want to awaken you want to access the greater spheres of yourself and expand your consciousness of your awareness into these greater levels of yourself this is the way that it can be done mm -hmm. yeah so these maps are tried and true Mm -hmm. Right. Like there have been many awakened masters that have come out of the tantric system. Um, yeah, it's 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 a miraculous system. It's also very deep, very rich, very difficult. complex, very difficult. Like most Westerners don't actually have the you know, we're we're used to a society now where it's like I want what I want when I want it, how I want it. And I don't want to have to work too hard for it. Like we're all about convenience and we're all about quick fixes. And so there's a rewiring that has to happen when we enter into these ancient systems because these were not that, you know, this was developed way back when things were moved a lot slower and where people were more connected to nature still, you know, because they had to be, you mm -hmm. know, survival depended on it. And, um, you know, without so much external noise, they were able to really be with the energies within that's what the science of tantra arose out of right mm -hmm. being aware of um 
like for instance our sexual energy how it flow how it naturally flows in the body how it kind of draws us through life that energy of desire and how if we choose to harness that and um kind of draw it inward and upward so to speak we can also all of a sudden use that same energy that we could use for procreation for awakening right Mm -hmm. wow that's amazing and so now we still in this day and age have these maps you know but not it's few and far between the people that actually have the discipline and the devotion to really step into the system to really understand it i mean i i've been studying for a decade now and i still feel like i'm like tippy toe you know because i now understand and i see what it takes and and even for me i'm committed to the path and i'm taking my time with it because i'm like okay once i go a certain level i'm fully committed and uh when you're doing some of these sciences there's actual like you know internal slash external rites that you are performing and you might have to do it for 40 days two hours a day and if you break this the, it's called a sadhana it's it's a daily practice or um something like this if you break the sadhana you have to start all the way from the beginning uh if you're not overseen by somebody who know who really understands like things could go wrong because you're working with really powerful energies i mean it's really it's deep stuff right yeah. <laughs> and um what i always say i'm kind of tangenting here but what I always say about the the sexual tantra and um, you know, sex, like I said, sexual energy, sex itself is included in specifically the left hand path of tantra. There are two, well, there's more than two paths, but j- you can categorize them in right handed tantra or left handed tantra. In India, they eat with the right hand, so they nourish the the body with the right hand, and they wipe their bottoms with their left hand. So it kind of means like the clean path. <laughs> and and they wipe their bottom with their actual hand. Actual it's not hand like and water. They don't use and toilet water. paper. No toilet paper. Yeah, yeah. They just, right. Yeah. So this is kind of like the dirty hand. So the left hand of Tantra does involve sexual acts. Uh, it involves eating meat, which if you understand the context of Hinduism, which is kind of the predominant religion under which, uh, well, Tantra doesn't exist under the religion per se, but it, it's in the same bubble, the same context as Hinduism. Like real deal Hindus are vegetarian, right? So if you're on the right-hand path of Tantra, you're not going to have be having sex. You're going to be... At most, all? Or... Most of them who are hardcore on that path, no. Uh-huh. They're celibate, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's... Uh, Do they not know, marry then? Like not they're usually they're sometimes, on a spiritual path. but it yeah, it'll be a very much like more of a spiritual based marriage, um, something right. like that. So, but they don't eat meat. They they don't do alcohol. The left hand path. I've been in ceremonies in tantric temples in India where they had a bottle of whiskey, and between the two priests who are doing the puja, puja is like the ceremony, right? And it can go on for hours, and they're doing offerings and they're chanting uh, mantras to the deity, right? So tantra also involves a lot of deities. Um, such as Shiva and Shakti, but lots of like different expressions of Shiva and Shakti, the god and goddess, masculine, feminine principle. Um, and throughout the puja, this bottle of whiskey is gone. Like they're, you know, chanting, 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 Namaha or Swaha, taking a shot. And pretty soon there's no more alcohol. So <laughs> the same temple, they still practice animal sacrifice. So there's like, So when we talk about sex being involved, like actual sex being involved in Tantra, the ancient traditional system, it wasn't a romantic thing. It was two people. I'll explain what the ritual would have looked like. Um, And there there are people who still, but it's had to go really underground because of all the distortion, right? People in India aren't, aren't overtly practicing Tantra anymore. The people that are tend to be very occult and they tend to be very secretive because of how distorted tantras become it's kind of sad and is it it's not really accepted i mean is it kind of taboo in india yeah it's become taboo because of the sexuality so most people started going into tantra because of the sex it was a spiritual context that allowed them to have sex um or they went into it for what's called cities or gifts and so people can use the science of tantra 
for the betterment and upliftment of self and other or you know because it's a science like there started being a lot of like kind of black magic y stuff happening right you do the puja a certain way like to the point i'm gonna just i'm just gonna go there where they're doing pujas with dead human bodies and, and it's like I mean, Tantra is like so vast when we put it in the little bubble of the Western Neo-Tantra, we're missing half the like wild system. Kind of similar to like ayahuasca. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's like, like a whole dark side to included. it. Everything's included. There is a whole dark side to it. Right. Um, can be. Um, sure. Well, it's full spectrum. It's full spectrum. This is what I mean. Everything's included in Tantra. So the actual sexual rituals that they would do in Tantra um, had nothing to do with the sex, right? So you would have a male and female, and they do separate pujas on them, which they, would they be chanting mantras? And a puja is like a, puja, ce- a yeah, ceremony. Yeah, so a puja is a, 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 cere- a, a tantric ritual. Ritual, okay. Um, where they, they do specific offerings that relate to the five elements, right? This is a science again. Um, and it's an alchemy. It's an inner inner alchemy right so everything we do external is only to activate particular energies within our bodies right the goal is never external even if we're working with so there's these sim- symbolic things that mm-hmm. you're doing in the ritual yeah, that so you're offering like are flowers helping you to and incense and cultivate candlelight. the internal state mm-hmm. it help, yeah. helping you to sort of yeah by setting your external state your you're setting your internal state. Yeah. So as you're doing all the offerings, you're chanting very specific mantras. And these mantras, uh, if you're not familiar with the term mantra, it's a, it's like an invocation. So you're speaking, but it's in an ancient ancient language of Sanskrit, most of the mantras. Um, some of them are called bija mantras, which means it's a seed mantra, which means within one syllable, one little syllable contains this whole energy of a particular deity. And I want to talk a little bit about deity in Tantra too, because it's not just like, I'm Shakti and you're Shiva. <laughs> you know, it's, it's these deities actually represent, um, I mean, they are gods and goddesses, but they represent specific aspects of creation. So when I'm worshiping Shiva, for instance, what I'm really trying to get to is that pure consciousness I was speaking of before. Right. Because that's what Shiva represents. Yeah. That's what he represents. That's the energy of Shiva. Now, why? Can we- well, I want to talk a little bit, like before we go beyond that. Yeah. Um, because like in Hinduism, it seems that all of these deities, and maybe this is where you're going, these deities are representative of mm-hmm. certain energetics or certain, they're archetypes, basically. They're archetypes. And exactly. like, I think in the West, when we like we probably we label hinduism as a polytheistic religion right Mm -hmm. like meaning many gods and oh this is the god of this this is the god of this um but and i know very little about hinduism so correct me if i'm wrong but it seems to me that within that system like we're missing something on the outside by saying it's this polytheistic religion that actually the um that they're not necessarily these like gods, but these um, archetypes and symbols of Mm -hmm. a universal energetic, which exists within and without oneself in the external and in the internal. And so by like worshiping the God Shiva, it's different than maybe how God is worshiped in Western tradition. Very different. Yeah. And it's more of like an an acknowledgement of a uni- of um, maybe not universal, but like eternal and an aspect of etern- eternity or an aspect yeah. of the divine consciousness that exists. And it's not necessarily like an external worship of like separation of like, oh, I'm worshiping Shiva and Shiva is not me, but it's like coming into unity or come yeah. or coming into alignment with that energetic that Shiva represents. Right. There's a mantra, Shiva Oham. I am Shiva. We chant that over and over and over again, right? Until we have the the direct gnosis that we are Shiva. And that's that's so, so different than <laughs> the way that Western religions do things. Yeah. And it's and it's so misunderstood too. So I feel mis- like yeah. there's so many things that are misunderstood about Eastern mm-hmm. traditions. Yeah. All of them. 
um, just because of the Western paradigm and how we treat spirituality or religion. Um, we think about it in such a different way that it can be even difficult to understand just a different way of seeing it. Yeah, absolutely. And you said that very eloquently, basically, how you explain that whole process and what deity is. So I want to expound on that even further. Please. That the reason that they, uh, I don't know if this is quite the right word, but anthropomorphize these energies into deities, like made them human relatable, yeah. is because if we're thinking of a concept like supreme consciousness, then it, it stays kind of unattainable. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the Western religions, they're all about unattainability because then they have control over you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whereas in the East, it's like, you know, all of a sudden we have Shiva. I can have a relationship with Shiva, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can be his beloved. And so this is another fun thing we play with in Tantra is that we get to have a different relationship. So we could look at Shiva as our beloved. We could look at him as our father. We could look at him as like our, our guru, um, master yogi, you know, and each of those is going to, if I look at him from one of those lenses versus another, it's going to be a very different relationship simultaneously Shakti, you know, his consort, the feminine principle, Devi, the goddess, right? Mm -hmm. She can be the mother. She could be the, the, the beloved also. She could be, you know, anything. Like we, we all of a sudden can have these different relationships and all of a sudden we can feel close, right? To, to these energies, right? We can offer ourselves to them. And this is, you know, it's a part of the science, right? To become, you know, it's like, what if we worship this energy so much that all of a sudden one day we become it? Mm -hmm. And so this I'm going to use as a segue to complete about the 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 real the traditional tantric rituals with sex, mm -hmm. because that's what would happen: is you would instill by uh, pujaris or pujarinis. These are people who perform pujas, so they'd have their sub their subjects, which would be like the usually it would be a man and a woman. And they would instill the deities into these beings, right? So in the kind of more neo-tantra school I studied at, we would do something called transfiguration where you would sit, men and women would sit facing each other and we'd like kind of soften our awareness um, and kind of diffuse our gaze, soften the gaze until the man would become Shiva. Like the, the women would view the man as Shiva. The man would transmit the energy of Shiva then likewise the woman would transmit Shakti and the man would view her as Shakti, right? So this transfiguration. Now that's like the simple way to do it. The way that they would do it traditionally is they'd be chanting all these mantras until the, that couple would have the, the direct experience of being deity. So by the time they came into sexual union, which was symbolic, it wasn't about the sex, this was symbolic. And then the pujaris would be doing puja or making offerings to them as Shiva and Shakti in sexual union, which means duality coming into that sweet merger of union. Um, when you say it's symbolic, like, are they not actually the having union. sex? No, they would be okay. actually. This left hand again. So this is called the Maituna ritual. Uh -huh. Maituna being sexual union. So they would actually be coming together. So but these people were no longer like... Harry and Sally's. <laughs> they were now Shiva and Shakti, but for reals, like the energy would be activated yeah. in a in a way, and either they could do that for themselves, or they would have people, uh, you know, these these pujarinis and doing it for them. Do you know our Harry and Sally? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Before it came out. Are they like? Are are they still there? Like the, the, those personalities uh, and, and or have they been completely replaced by the Shiva and Shakti energy? So, is it is it in addition to like, do they still have their kind of, per, do you know? So um, one of the greatest gifts in my life was a pilgrimage I made to India uh, to a very specific place and teacher where I got to have a direct experience, um, not of a Maituna ritual, but of a, a solo ritual where I um, basically had the puja done on me. And 
it was one of the most profound experiences of my life. And Halo left the building and something much greater came through. And so from that experience, I kind of had a huge download of, of what the actual my tuna rituals were like. And from my experience, no. And, and honestly, it's like you're aware of the sexual energy to a point, but I think a lot of people are aware of the chakra system. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, Tantra very much works with the chakra system, right? So we have our lower chakras and then we have our higher chakras and the energy gets more and more subtle as they go up the chakras, right? So while the energy is still in the lower chakras, we have sexual pleasure. And it is that site. So here's one of the key points I wanted to get to. The sexual energy is the important piece. It's not the sex. You know, it's not about having great sex. It's about using our sexual energy in a way that we don't predominantly use it to achieve, to move into those higher chakras, to achieve that goal of inner union where we're no longer split, you know, where we're no longer so subscribed to duality and separation. So from my experience, once the energy moved up into the higher centers, I couldn't even feel like sexual stimulation, mm -hmm. like something much larger opened up in me. And it was, I had a direct experience of the Anandamaya Kosha, which is that bliss body. Mm -hmm. And um, simultaneously, this is another very, very, very tantric concept that we are divine. So when we're worshiping deity, what we're doing is we're sanctifying these different energies within creation. We're saying that like, this is sacred. This is beautiful. This whole thing that's happening, the beautiful, the terrible, all of it is included in this being a divine experience. Right. We tend to think, especially in the West, the divine realm or heaven is out there somewhere. But what if we have direct access to it? What if it's just a shift in the lens of our perception and our experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we come into that place, we, we recognize that everything's divine. So as we're worshiping, whether it's an external thing or not, we are acknowledging the sanctity and divinity that exists within creation. So what in some of the tantric ceremonies, they, I was actually like in this one I'm particularly speaking of, and I'm going to be vague because it's, you know, it's a very sacred, it was a very sacred experience for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to share too many details, but um, I was being worshipped as the goddess during this ritual and literally the goddess came into me. And there really aren't, aren't, aren't so many words for that, to have that direct transmission of what that specific frequency, because when I say the goddess, they're like, thousands of names and forms of, of Shakti, right? So one particular one came into me. This puja was for a particular frequency of the goddess. And um, can you say which one? Yeah, it's uh, her name is Lalita Tripura Sundari, and she is the beauty of the three worlds. Um, so she is all about that descending lunar energy. They call it Soma. So when we have an awakening experience, uh, here's here's the next wormhole. So what is the, like, okay, so I spoke on the larger uh, view of what Tantra is, but now let's get practical, right? Because it's a science and science doesn't work on like, well, it's the universal energy, <laughs> universal consciousness coming together. Well, how? How? Yeah. Right? What's the how? Okay. So obviously I talked about puja. So puja is one of the methods. Um, yoga, actually, any form of yoga basically came out of the tantric system. So um, yoga is part of the science of awakening, right? And when I say yoga, I don't specifically mean asana or like your vinyasa class you go to every Monday. I'm talking about pranayama, so breath control and alteration, and, and there's so many different pranayamas. I'm talking about bandhas, where we're activating our um, genital muscles. We're pulling up mula bandha. We're activating our... Um, abdominals with Uddiyana Bandha, like we're learning to draw energy up, seal it, lock it in the body. Pranayama helps to direct prana as energy. Talk so, more about that because the uh, the Bandhas are, I've had a powerful experience of those too. Yeah. Like, so like what, like, yeah. please say more like what is the Bandha and 
um, like how to use them and why. Mm -hmm, Totally. So in yoga, um, what we're doing is we're preparing. So yoga is very, very, very important in the tantric system because when we start to awaken these energies within us, they are strong. Like shit can go wrong. Am I allowed to say? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> shit can go wrong when we're doing this. If we're not guided, we're not prepared. So basically... And they can be... It can feel overwhelming yeah. and almost make you feel crazy. We can blow circuits. Literally, there's something called Kundalini syndrome that can happen and you can you can go crazy. Yeah. If you're not preparing, you know, this is a really important thing to explain to Westerners because we're like, I'm just going to go Let's for go it. Let's go for it. And it's yeah. like, no, there's an intelligence to the step-by-step process. Exactly. There's an intelligence to ideally having a guru guiding the process and there if something goes wrong to get you back on track, <laughs> right? So uh, to explain bandhas, I have to go into kundalini. So very important, like basis of the tantric system is the energy of kundalini. What is kundalini? I think many people are familiar with this term uh, in this day and age in the spiritual systems. But if you're not, um, kundalini is this slumbering. So we talked a lot about Shiva. Shiva is pure consciousness, right? So then we have Shakti. Shakti is pure energy. She's also form. She's the five senses, anything we can experience. So basically everything. She's everything. And Shiva is that which witnesses everything, mm-hmm. right? So Kundalini is this immense energy. It's this immense life force energy that lives curled up, coiled up in our lower chakras, like right around Muladhara, which is the, the, the root chakra. And she dances a little bit. It's not like... Is it in all of those bodies? Mm-hmm. Like it's in the physical body, it's in the pranic body? I'm speaking specifically of the physical body, okay. but it's an energy that's okay. that lives there right mm-hmm. it's not there's not an actual serpent coiled up at the base of your spine but, <laughs> but there's an energy that's represented by a, as a serpent right and this is something really cool about this is you find this serpent i mean adam and eve just saying you find the serpent all over representing this energy of consciousness and it often represents the creative aspect well, in religions yeah. all over. and so to get really interesting Adam and Eve, what what did that serpent represent? Uh, well, the serpent, I mean, the serpent was the one that encouraged Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge. Is right, that... which ended up getting her into a lot of trouble. And so the serpent kind of fell from grace. Well, what happens when that serpent, you know, is is made wrong? Something, a force that lives inside of us that literally leads us to the tree of knowledge, gnosis of who we are, when all of a sudden that becomes sinful, Hmm. when we're cut off from that, now you have complete control over humanity. So there was a design in that story, I believe. (laughs) And uh, we approach it differently in this tradition. We say that serpent is going to take us where we need to go, where we have a direct connection with the divine without any inter- intermediary. The Christian faith nowadays is all about the intermediary. I have to go and confess my sins. You know, if I'm a sexual being, I'm born from sin automatically. Like right. all of a sudden there's no way I can directly connect to source myself. Right? I have to go to church. I God have to have is a pastor. out there. Yeah. Exactly. Not in here. In Tantra, we can only, ha- I mean, even if we have a guru, the guru is just there, like a true guru. will never try to have power over a disciple. A true guru will help that disciple become their own guru, will help that disciple awaken mm-hmm. on their own in themselves, right? And so... <laughs> So with Kundalini, this is our direct access, right? But usually Kundalini is just dancing between our lower two chakras. It's not completely asleep. It's like, you know, but it hangs out in the lower realms, right? Which is why... What what might that experience feel like? It's like what we're experiencing on planet Earth right now. All but I mean, <laughs> but I mean, just for the average person who, you know, goes about yeah. they don't think about we're, any of this. We're driven by survival and sex and food. And but you, by by saying that that energy oscillates between the first two chakras, you're mm-hmm. meaning that basically basically that's 
where people's primary consciousness is yeah. is survival and sexuality myself included most of us are operating from like our our first two chakras mm -hmm. right which have to do with survival have to do with security have to do with sexuality have to do with emotions have to do with ego right so as we move up in the chakras we start to transcend our ego um so through yoga, and this is where I'm getting into the bandhas, because the bandhas very specifically work with kundalini, right? So does pranayama, all of yoga, actually. It's not real yoga if you're not working with uh, kundalini. Is kundalini degree. like the, the primary energy or it's just an energy? It's primary. That, okay. So I want to get into that because, uh, so here's the fun thing. So we have three main, they're called nadis or any energy channels in the bodies. And this is another thing that the Egyptians were working with this, the Taoists were working with this, like so many different traditions back in a, in a day that there wasn't internet, right? They were all coming up with the same maps. So to me, that's right. like, there is something to this. So on, you know, obviously we have our spine, that's the central channel. And that's the, the pathway that Kundalini takes as she awakens and rises. Um, on the right side, we have the Pingala Nadi. Pingala represents the solar energy. So now we're in duality, right? So we have solar masculine energy, right side. And then on the left side, we had, have Ida Nadi, which is the lunar feminine energy. So we can control these Nadis with this uh, split nostril pranayama, right? I can balance the energy of the Nadis. Uh, so the, the idea... What, what again was the Nadi? The Nadi is Nadi like... is an energy. It's like a meridian Okay. In, uh, it's a, in the Chinese system, it's an energy pathway. Okay. But these nadis that go on the sides of the bodies, what do they do? So we got our spine, we got our chakras. It, they go like this. So and for people who are that? just listening, that you're making like a crisscrossing. They, they do like, like a, a crisscrossing. Like a, like a DNA and then they almost. meet uh, at the pineal gland, third eye. Yeah. So when we have an awakening, it's because Ida and Pingala are, are balancing, coming together, and so all of a sudden we have this spiritual awakening. They start together <laughs> at, at the, the root, base of at the, the spine, base of spine with the where the Kundalini is, and then they <laughs> go to the left and the right of the central mm -hmm. channel, yeah. and then they come together Cross, again like at each of the chakra points, mm -hmm. and yeah. then they they go yeah. back and forth like that, and then yeah. they meet. They can sometimes the energy can run up and down, but a lot of times the, it's doing this oscillate oscillation. So again, this goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning, where it's like through duality, we're heading towards unity. So they say, so then Sushumna, which is the central channel, the spine that the Kundalini is in, Sushumna is beyond duality. Once we have that awakening, it's like we're done. We're, we're not subscribing to duality anymore. And when I say that, we're no longer seeing like if I'm looking at Finch, I'm not seeing Finch. I'm seeing like the divine right? So it's not like I don't start still perceive things out here, but all of a sudden I see the divine nature in everything, right? The veils lift and I see things as they really are. We have so many veils of perception as I was speaking of earlier. So the goal of yoga is to balance uh, or tantra, both, um, same, same, but different, uh, is to balance Ida and Pingala Nadi, so that then it's supposedly Tell once again, they balance, in, Pingala and Pin I, Ida and Pingala Ida are and Pingala. the solar and lunar energy okay. in the body. Mm -hmm. So let's take Hatha Yoga, for instance. Hatha means sol lunar solar, right? So we're balancing through that whole system of yoga, Tantra Yoga. Mm -hmm. We are balancing the, the lunar and solar energies in the body. The goal of that is that once they balance, right? Because before then, just like in the Tao, we're, we're oscillating between too much yin, too much yang, like not enough yin, not, we're, we're oscillating and we're attempting to walk that middle path. So until the point of balance, we are oscillating between lunar and solar, we're subscribing to duality. All of a sudden, through these sciences, these practices, they balance out. So pranayama is one of the best ways to work with, with this level of balance, which is breath control, right? Different techniques of breath control. And then once they balance, kundalini is able to awaken. So we're preparing the body through asana. We're preparing the energy through pranayama. Um, basically, we need to upgrade our whole system because it's like plugging a, I'm not good with numbers, but a <laughs> whatever watt 
like cord into a like huge what you know and so it's like if we're not ready for that like zing it's a very electric energy it can literally fry us or if it goes up the wrong pathway because sometimes kundalini could shoot up one of those side nadis and not go up the central channel so we're working with the chakras to clear up the central channel um so this is also true when we do are if we are working with sexual energy specifically and we're working with a partner, it's the same concepts, but it's here's where it gets <laughs> it's less romantic than than neo tantra makes it because it would be like do, you're basically doing yoga in bed, right? You're like have, like breathing and doing bandhas. So the bandhas are different locks that we do with our physical body. So there's mula bandha, which locks. Uh, it's a lifting up and in of the genital muscles or of the PC muscle, um, but but on a deep level. And this starts to draw the energy up the spine, right? So we're inviting Kundalini to awaken. Uddiyana Bandha is next. So this is at Manipura or that uh, navel center, the fire center. So now I'm drawing that in and up and you actually suck the belly in and up. So, so you're, squ creates you're a big squeezing the body first like at the at the base like the mula bandha usually do it in an exhale so you'd exhale completely mm -hmm. and then without inhaling because you can't really pull up uddiyana bandha with uh with breath you want to be without breath yeah so empty um you draw everything in and up then we have jalandhara bandha we bring the chin in towards the chest and then we might add shambhavi mudra which is looking up so basically what this is doing is pumping energy up so we're inviting kundalini energy to rise now something i'll say this will not be a popular thing for some people to hear but um there's like the western version of kundalini awakening which means like you know, maybe Ida or Pingala got tickled or your sexual energy started to flow. That's called Ojas, right? Ojas is our sexual energy. It's the same as Jing in the Taoist system. So that might start to get all, you know, but people have profound sexual experiences and they're like, I had a Kundalini experience. Now it's possible, but <laughs> people who have a real Kundalini awakening that goes right, they're enlightened beings. Like that's what a kundalini awakening does. So people who are like, oh, I have a kundalini awakening every time me and my boyfriend come together, or whatever it is. There are a lot of different energies happening. A kundalini awakening, you will know. And it's not exactly all kittens and rainbows when it happens. You know, there's a there's a fire that we have to go through. So uh, just speaking a little more on the process of awakening, I know this is getting heady, but. Um, yeah, I want to say too, just that like, we don't, there's no pressure to like cover all of all Tantra. Things, in this. I know. Because I know we're, excited. yeah, you're very passionate. I love it. Um, but we are, we're throwing, we're throwing a lot of information out yeah, there. Yeah, totally. And which is great, but I want to make sure that like it, it, yeah, it's like, you know, um, it's absorbable. Palatable. It's absorbable. Totally. Yeah. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear more. I'm not sure wh where you were about to go, but like, like let's give people just something more to connect to of like, like maybe personal experiences that you've mm -hmm. had or, or just like, so because you're so deep in this path, you've been studying <laughs> it for so long and, um, you you know all of these like sanskrit terms for all the I different know, things all fancy well yeah i mean it's a beautiful system yeah. but just for like the person who knows absolutely nothing about this i mean let's let's say you know yeah there's somebody who has been doing yoga classes they've just mm -hmm. started meditating and they are attracted to this sense that there's more in these mm -hmm. Eastern traditions, totally. somebody like that, who's just like, well, like, so how does, how does a person like that get started? Or how did you get started mm -hmm. in this? Like, how that's, did you that's come? That's a great question. Yeah. Because, and here's, here's the gift in, uh, you know, as I call it the Neo Tantra realm, that is how I got started. You know, I was a young, like 21 year old woman. I'm 32 now. And I had so much sexual energy and my everything had everything to do with sex. You know, it was like that was my main driving force. And, you know, and I but not just sex, like 
I wanted, I was very spiritual. I wanted like really deep intimacy and like profound connections. And some of my most kind of poignant spiritual experiences came through sex, sexual experiences, right? I would come into these planes of awareness and existence that were like incredibly profound. And when I first heard about Tantra, which I wish I remember how that happened, but I don't. Um, But it was, you know, at at the age of 21, I think, you know, I started reading some books. There are some amazing books to kind of start to go down the path of the philosophy. Um, And it just resonated so deeply. I fell in love with Shiva and Shakti. And like, I'm being very practical in this talk. There's a very romantic way of looking at Tantra as well. And that's that everything that exists is the love play between Shiva and Shakti, right? This is the reason that the universe manifested the way that it did is because, you know, Shiva and Shakti separated. So this is the beauty of that separation. And now Shakti is dancing for her her beloved and showing him how beautiful and how marvelous she can be in all these different forms and expressions and experiences. And then he and and Shakti is the, is the manifestation, right? Mm-hmm. Of she's the manifest that consciousness. Anything, everything so, that's manifest. All uh, all of physical reality, all thoughts, all imagination, everything. Exactly. Right. Emotions. And then Shiva represents the, the consciousness, the witness. this witnessing. So that. when like Adya Shanti, I think probably talks about the witness. Like a lot of spiritual teachers talk about the witness, right? Mm-hmm. That's Shiva. So when you're so, saying that Shakti is dancing for Shiva, you're saying dancing. like the she's manifestation of all yeah. that is, all of yeah. this creation is, is dan- like all that is, is dancing for the witness that is the divine right. consciousness. So dancing for uh, what they consider the masculine principle of pure consciousness. And then Shiva is so enamored with his beloved's dance that he now manifests in all of you know, everything she creates, like myself and Finch included, now, you know, she creates this and now Shiva's like, oh, this is so, you know, beautiful and unique and inspiring. So then he manifests the consciousness that witnesses through her forms. So it's this beautiful game. They call it uh, another Sanskrit term, (laughs) since I'm sure you're all hungry for one more, is Leela, the play. Right. So it's this beautiful love play between them. So when I started reading about that, I was just like, yes, like it just spoke my language. So the way I started was through yoga, was through um, my sexuality and wanting to have deeper, more profound, intimate experiences with the masculine. Some of it came out of like having really difficult experiences with the masculine. I'd say that's been a big impetus for for my journey was wanting to heal the rift in myself between the masculine and feminine and that starts within ourselves so tantra lays out a map for doing that right and and for having more fulfilling relationships with everything but specifically that relationship between these two poles um and finding that common ground i think that's what we're all really you know on a a basic human level we're all looking for that like we're all looking for connection like even with our partners it's like you know conflict arises when we're not seeing on the same level and connection is there when we're we're on that same frequency Mm -hmm. right and so when we can create that harmony so tantra can be used in relationship to to help you know the for example the more balanced i am in my lunar and solar masculine feminine aspects you know, back to the hologram theory, if we are walking in a hall of mirrors, then that's going to reflect out. And this is why in spiritual traditions, the most important work is inside ourselves, right? Because Mm -hmm. as soon as we clean up in here, you know, out here starts to look a lot better. It's an interesting relationship, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I've always felt exactly that way about romantic relationship too, that the the strongest partnerships are formed by two people who are, are actively doing that work to uh, on themselves and, and to to come into harmony with themselves and that it's not it's not about fight like completing oneself through the other but i mean there's there's a support there and there's there is an alchemy i find yeah. that um and we can help each other and assist each other, but it's, um, 
I've I've always looked at relationship at or my my desire to have more of that that partnership and that like I am in this partnership in service to my partner and to support their growth and yeah. and she is in service to me and we're not trying and that's that's more of the structure that I've always desired more than like oh I'm you know like let's see what we can get out of each other or or I'm empty in this way and I need this thing from you which is how most relationships are approached from that point or at least have moments of that you know when our wounds are triggered or something we might try to get something we never got out as a child out of our partner or something like that you know so we have those moments but yeah that that's ultimately the goal is to have a balanced beautiful relationship to to be expressions microcosmic expressions in our relationships to that great dance of shiva and shakti but in order to do that each person has to take responsibility for their part in yeah. in coming to the mm-hmm. relationship from that place totally and and you know we're all human we make mistakes we're all learning um, but to take take responsibility for those times that we make mistakes um, and also to have acceptance and understanding for the mistakes of the other mm-hmm. and because I mean God it, it all gets messy relationship gets messy spiritual practice gets messy like, we love this overly romanticized version of the fairy tale romance and um, the spiritual path that's all light and love but the reality just doesn't like it's messy, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it doesn't. And I think there can be a disappointment. I know I, probably most of us who are past a certain age <laughs> have experienced I've that had disappointment a few disappointments along the way <laughs> of realizing <laughs> that the Disney fairy tale romance thing that we, that we were taught was possible or we were taught to strive for um, and we go into our early relationships with that expectation or mm-hmm. that desire, there is a disappointment. Maybe even sooner than that, when we find out that Santa Claus isn't real, right. you know. Um, and it is, it's more difficult, but I think more empowering to sink into the reality, which is that everything takes a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And the more willing you are to come into acceptance of that and mm-hmm. to commit to what's necessary, the better off you're going to be. Totally. To work inside and out. And this is another place where, you know, the system of Tantra is a really beautiful um, container because Tantra is not, and this is another thing with some of the New Agey Tantra, it is not all about the bliss. You know, that's an aspect. Tantra encompasses the whole. And I think one of the issues in human relationship with self and other uh, at this day and time is that everyone wants, you know, like if you think of antidepressants, they put people at this like even keel, like, okay, we're safe here. You know, we're not going into the dark too much. We are so afraid of the dark. We're so resistant to it. You know, like things are, I've I've experienced this in my relationships. Things are humming along great. And then there's a kink and all of a sudden you're ready to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you Mm -hmm. know, like, Mm -hmm. and it's like, we need to get comfortable. We live in a realm that our only guarantee upon birth. What is that? Death. Death. So we need to get a little bit more comfortable with the darker aspects of ourselves. You know, when, when we're, in a transformational process, I really don't believe we, it's like some people seem to think that that means we're like getting rid of our dark matter. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I don't think at all that that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. We're transforming it. Or even this idea of transcending the ego, like there, there is that there's what that actually is. And then there's what I think (laughs) a lot of people think that is. It's like transcending the ego is not getting away you don't get anything. rid of your ego. No. The ego, that's like a permanent installment. But, we, but but sometimes people talk about killing the ego. You know, that's like... I think in a real awakening process, there is a, a there's an ego death. But what that is, it, is it doesn't mean that the ego just completely goes away. But what it does mean 
is that ego is like steering the ship. It's like a kindergartner who somehow got a hold of the freaking control system. <laughs> and they're, you know, sometimes they're doing all right and other times they're freaking tanking things. So basically we want our higher consciousness to be like, you work for me actually. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> so the, the ego becomes a servant and not the master, mm-hmm. right? So that's what we're aiming at, I think, with that. Um, and there's, it's, there's a process of training, basically, oh, yeah. is, is how I look at it. Yeah. And um, one thing, one early thing I learned in meditation, because when I first started meditating, I had all of these expectations of what, what it looks like to meditate or <laughs> how to meditate properly. And I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to sit here and I'm supposed to sit with my spine completely straight and I'm not supposed to think any thoughts. That's how <laughs> meditating yeah. works. But, uh, where was I going to go with that? Totally lost my train of thought. Meditating properly versus what it actually is. Yeah. Something. Oh, wow. I totally blanked. Anyway. Um, bas- basically I found out that, yeah, um, the, the true, the true practice of anything in this context, meditation, um, it, it, it differs from the expectation of that. And oh. okay. I remember where I was going. Um, what I learned was it's the, it's the nature of the untrained mind to wander. Absolutely. And so for me to expect that I was going to sit down and meditate and have no thoughts was completely naive. I had no, I didn't, I didn't know that I had no experience and I thought, oh, I should just be able to sit down and meditate and be still Um, and I experienced great frustration in the beginning of my inability to even, to, to even sit and be still even for just 10 minutes, even just for one minute, even just to sit and be still in my mind and in my internal state for one minute, I found was difficult and very frustrating. But through the process of continuing to do that, I realized it's the nature of the untrained mind to wander Mm -hmm. and it's only, and that's what the practice is about. And, and you can't just jump to the results. Like I like to say, there's no shortcut up the mountain. No, like you can't, there's no, you, you know, you go around it. There's no shortcut. You have to go whatever it looks like and going up is hard. Like every step of altitude you have to climb. Um, in, in that physical example or in the metaphorical metaphor of it. So yeah, it's there, there is that kind of just where the rubber meets the road. Like if like, and I think that one thing we all have in common is that we want to be happy. Like we, we like Mm -hmm. to experience um, positive states of being and and we, we we like to feel happy we like to feel pleasure we like to feel good and we're I think most of us are motivated to feel good as much as possible but the ways that we're taught about how to achieve that especially in this culture don't necessarily produce that result and I think we are afraid of the dark in this culture. We are afraid of deeper aspects of ourselves. We're Mm -hmm. afraid of things in the world and what that triggers in us. But I think what, what I have discovered is that the, the deeper path to happiness, you have to, you have to embrace all of that. And for me to get deeper into my meditation practice, I had to accept that, my meditation is not always going to feel good and yeah. that part of that practice and part of the training of the mind to become still involves working through that. And eventually I actually found, ironically, I found more comfort and more stillness once I reached the point of acceptance Ding. and realizing that like, I'm going to sit and meditate for say 30 minutes and that's what I'm doing for this 30 minutes. And when I'm 
actually able to release my attachment to having a certain experience in that 30 mm-hmm. minutes, then like I actually release a mental burden which disturbs me it's this sort of weird paradoxical thing whatever that is yeah you know? like once yeah. like in trying to do something so hard whether it's meditation or your job or anything in life like there's this mental striving or there's there's a stress and a pressure of like trying to do something it's so hard to describe, but there there's kind of a stillness and a peace when you can do without doing. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's a paradox. Like how can you do without doing? But there there is a way to sort of like tap into a deeper grace within oneself. And yeah. you sort of, you can release the mental stress aspect of whatever it is that you're doing and just move forward in that kind of like place of clarity and purpose. Absolutely. I refer, I mean, ultimately all of this is about coming back to being natural and it's kind of, it's, it's kind of mind blowing how far we've gone from just being natural, you know, like societal conditioning and like just, there's so much stuff at, on this, you know, this day and time in in space in reality and so what what we're doing with with any spiritual practice is like essentially learning how to be human again like what does it actually mean to be a human right do we even know anymore you know so so we're relearning and and ultimately all of these traditions tantra Tao. um the Egyptian alchemies, the the Mayan work, like whatever, whatever wormhole you choose to go down. Ideally, we're retapping into our essential nature. This means this means like something that is untarnished, regardless of external circumstances, regardless of darker light, regardless of attraction and aversion, which are huge principles in Tantra. It's like yeah, we, we do. We have attraction and aversion. Like you said, it's like, I want to be happy. I want to feel good. I want to get all the things I want now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then we have aversion where we're just like, whoa, I don't even want to know that exists in the world. <laughs> like That doesn't or, feel good. I don't like that. Yeah, I don't want to be near that. Yeah. yeah. And, and the alchemy, like how we t- transcend duality is not by pushing away. And that's the first thing we try to do when we don't like something is we try to get it as far away from us as possible, um, which I feel like ends up manifesting in disease. It, you know, what we resist persists kind of thing. So mm-hmm. in relationship, if you've ever noticed if your partner starts to have a process and your first reaction is like, Meh, all of a sudden that process it gets a lot bigger and a lot louder and a lot crazier than if you'd just been like, oh, this is happening. Okay, I surrender. Here because we, here there's there's often a need there, like beyond our own reaction to it, which may be positive or maybe negative. There's something mm-hmm. that's happening and there's a need to be addressed. And mm-hmm. especially with the things that we're averted to, there's some, there's some challenge there, yeah. which in confronting the challenge there can be learning and growth or yeah there there's some need to be met and i mean i'm i'm a, a resistant person i have a lot of aversion resistance maybe we all do but we i all do. yeah we, we all, all do. do but and so it's you know a as i speak about this it's yeah, a practice which exactly. means we're not there yet we're all learning right. you know and that's the idea with the, going back to the ego the ego is all about attraction and aversion. Mm-hmm. But when we can all of a sudden be like, hey, actually, what's true freedom? What's true liberation? That means I get to decide. The higher version of me gets to decide how to respond rather than react to mm-hmm. any given situation, whether it's negative or positive. Right. right? That's and you're liberation. using quotes because that's just the yeah. <laughs> that's the judgment. I mean, not the everyone can see this. The judgment is negative or positive. Yeah. Right. That's the judgment we place upon mm-hmm. the thing. But regardless of that, that the thing is happening and right. there's, yeah, there, there's some, there's a need there to be addressed. So yeah. how do we, what's the deeper, you know, if we choose to believe, cause it's all a choice, we get to choose. Here's a huge power that we all have. 
we get to choose what we believe. Mm-hmm. You know, if if what I'm sharing about Tantra, you're just like, no, thanks. No, thanks. Great. Yeah, that's fine. that's your power. That's your choice. Um, power to you, you know, but where was I going with that? So, yeah, if we choose to believe, you know, any number of things, we can we can navigate these situations differently. If we choose to believe that there's a gift for us in every single thing, every single situation that life brings to us, right? This is for me what, you know, the school of Tantra is all about. Everything that exists has an innate intelligence. Everything that happens in my life, even if it's something horrific, Mm -hmm. like we are here as souls to evolve. Mm -hmm. Now, where the end goal of that, I don't know if there even is an end goal or if it's just like cyclical spirals into different dimensions of experience and we just, you know, it's potentially infinite. You know, but we are here. And when we trust the benevolence of life, you know, of this dance of Shiva and Shakti, which which maybe there isn't, you know, as I say that, I'm like, well, maybe life's not benevolent, you know, like things eat each other to survive. And, you know, this is part of the reality. But if we trust everything that life brings us, you know, then we can we can answer the different calls with an open attention and open awareness that says like, you know, even if something's challenging, for example, um, I was a professional dancer for a lot of years and I dedicated a good eight years of my adult life to studying a beautiful art form called Odissi dance in India. And I would give my whole life up, go to India, study, come home penniless without a place to live and have to start all over again. But I love this dance enough that I did that multiple times. I had a pattern going for a while. And um, eight years deep, steady, awesome progress, like really was at the peak of my dance experience. I got a knee injury that I'm still dealing with. It's been over a year. I'm completely out of dance. And I've had plenty of moments of being doing the like, why me? <laughs> like, why is this happening? Poor me, victim. And, and yet, when I draw the lens wider, you know, what was happening is I had so much identity wrapped around being the dancer, you know, and all of a sudden I was, and, and so like, I, I had this whole belief, like I could not be happy if I was not dancing. I couldn't be happy if I wasn't progressing in my dance, right? And when anything else was going wrong in any other department of my life, my escape was my dance. Now, all of a sudden the life did this very benevolent, ultimately benevolent thing for me. And it took that away. And it said, okay, now it's real. (laughs) And I was, oh my God, it's it's been a huge process. But now I'm like, oh, I I can be happy without dance. And, you know, I'm not limited to the identity of a dancer. And like other avenues of experience have opened up that wouldn't have had I still had that. I had to face things and actually get through them, you know, as a result of this injury. I had to step into adulting more hardcore. Dance was also, you know, it was like, it took up a lot of time in my energy and it wasn't, you know, super financially lucrative. So taking that out, it just, it laid a platform for a whole new level of experience. And while I still have a lot of grief inside of me for the experience, I feel like this will be one of those life lessons that will be one of the most profound and actually transformational experiences in my life. Mm -hmm. So, so dark light, you know, whatever, everything we're here to experience is, is, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not, it's not permanent. Right. You know, and so how do we, and it doesn't have to be bad. No, like, no. To label it as bad or tragic or it, things like in that. In some way, like what makes a flower so incredibly beautiful? It's not going to last long, but we'll still put the effort into like picking a bouquet and putting it in our home to make it more beautiful. You know, there's something almost more beautiful about the transience of that flower, the delicateness of that flower. You know, it's like, do we really want to pick a rose and have it just like be good? You know, (laughs) a year later, we still have the rose. There's something even more precious about that rose because it's not going to last. 
And I feel that's true with our lives. So it's a paradox. It's like on one hand, you know, how much do we really matter if we're like a blip in time only to pass away into like nothingness at some point? You know, so we can look at it from that way, but we can also look at it as like, wow, this is the only time potentially. I mean, I don't know, like it's a big hmm. mystery happening here. But this is potentially the only time that this version of existence that is Halo is ever going to exist. You know, and how do we look at our lives and how do we live our lives when we recognize that? When everything we do, we're doing in the face of death. So this is all tantric principle stuff, but also just a viewpoint that I've adopted because, again, I chose to put the power of my belief in this system and, and in these these realities. Um, realities. <laughs> lots, of par- lots of quotes happening here. Because um, <laughs> what do we really know? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like I can now approach every day. I can choose to approach every day of my life like it might be the last. And like my time here is limited and this is precious. Do I want to spend my life in a cubicle, like working for somebody else, like to make money to survive? You know, when we start to liberate ourselves, all of a sudden it's like we start to see what's actually important here. You know, love, connection, beauty, you know, and again, I'm naming all the positive qualities, but it's like that can even exist with a negative, like working on ourselves bettering you know when well, the, we, those negative experiences can bring us absolutely those, those the most rich well. like i was sharing about my knee and then also it's like let's bring in the the idea of karma right so karma well, before we move on to a new mm-hmm. thing i want to just talk about or yes you said some things too uh earlier that i want to follow up on so you were talking about like the this trust in the benevolence of life, uh, of life right? <laughs> and it just made me think about, like, it can be it can be challenging to adhere to that or or to align to that, and it's it can be so attractive to feel like these negative things happen to us or to take on this the this mentality of victimhood i mean Absolutely. there are terrible things that happen to people terrible things right that exist that exist <laughs> that happen to people and um i mean yeah people are assaulted people are raped people are murdered there are terrible things wars, that happen in the world like wars what's been yeah. going on in syria for way too long now <laughs> right mm-hmm. and i mean i happen to agree with you i feel like that life is benevolent and that the difficult things that happen to us we like no matter what happens to us we still have the choice of how we want to orient ourselves to that Mm -hmm. and so-called bad things are going to happen to all of us or or things that we wouldn't necessarily wish for but we can still orient ourselves to them in 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 a a, a more positive way of yeah. like, well, I'm not going to be victimized by this. I'm not going to choose like that's my part in it. I don't get the, to choose what happens to me, what what life events happen, but I'm not going to be a victim in it. I'm going to take this experience and make the most out of it. And that like, like every experience has a gift. Some of those gifts are more obvious than others. Some of them, but but like I said with my knee, it's like sometimes the most challenging things we experience in life, like fast forward our transformation tenfold. You exactly. know, when things are all good, it's like you can, we get lazy. And you can look like back. the universe has to shock us awake again for a minute. And I think we can all look back at some point in our life and and look at a situation that mm-hmm. we didn't wish for and something that was really difficult, but that we got through it and it made us stronger and it right. made us or who wiser we are. or, so, you know, more compassionate. Yeah. We know? learned something. We and learned something. Likewise, I think we can all look back at our life and, and maybe the very same incident can recognize where we resisted. 
like sometimes we don't have a choice. Sometimes just things are happening. You have to deal with it. Yeah. But sometimes we do have that choice and there's that, that sense of aversion. Yeah. And maybe it's, uh, you know, you're, you're in a relationship that's not working out and you're just avoiding what needs to happen. Either, either avoiding breaking up, you're avoiding really having a certain conversation, you're yeah. afraid of what they're going to think about this or that. Um, so you do have the choice to put off the thing you that can. wants to happen. Sometimes. The and challenge. then sometimes the universe will be like, okay, you don't get to put that off anymore. Right. In the case of my knee, it was very much that. I had been putting off some deep inner work and hiding behind my dance to avoid it. And when this happened, it was so, I was like, okay, now is the time. And it's actually, I can say that this was probably the most direct and empowering experience of my life that I can say that work is done. It was a pattern that I had been up against for years and years, like maybe since my childhood, like no, for sure, since my childhood. And once I finally, once the universe stopped giving me outs to doing mm -hmm. it and I had to do it, I actually, I feel there's some, uh, some huge weight that's been completely lifted from me, mm. completely. I have a new viewpoint. I'm having a new experience in life. So this is the power of Tantra, of really facing, you know, and including, you know, recognizing the mm -hmm. power in the darker aspects of life. Mm -hmm. And, and I do feel like what you're, what you're sharing, it, it goes into this idea of, of karma to some degree. Um, the idea of karma being that for every action we put out, ripple, it ripples, there's a reaction, right? So even if it's from, if we believe in reincarnation, things that we've done in other lifetimes, both negative or positive, can have a reactive effect in subsequent lifetimes. So there's, you know, for instance, sometimes things happen to us and we may not have a way of understanding the context of it. It could literally be from a past karma or, or what's also called samskara, which is are these patterns that we continually live out. Like when we have really core patterns in our lives where we're just like, my God, am I going to do that? Keep doing this until my deathbed? Really? You know, that's a samskara. It's something that's deeply ingrained in our psyche and we can actually transcend them. Where I wanted to go with karma, though, is that back to that like transient you know, the beauty of the transient. And, and yes, there are terrible things that happen. But how many people, you know, it's like we can we can have a negative experience and either become angry and jaded and then start putting out, you know, I feel like a lot of like school shootings, mass shootings, like like some of these hor more horrible things that happen. They come from somebody who who got triggered in a wound that they couldn't, they didn't have the conscious awareness to choose a different path. They were impulsed to just take this intense energy inside of them and, and do something, create an action, right? Um, but then there are others, like the first example that's coming to my mind is Martin Luther King, right? He, he came from, you know, a very negative experience of suppression for the color of his skin and his background, right? And what did he choose to do with that? Granted, you know, he was shot. But, <laughs> um, but the waves that he created as a result, his I have a dream, you know, he chose a different approach than getting angry and getting revenge. And it, has, it set the motion for so many other humans to become liberated, to become like, more equal unfortunately we still have a distance to go with this but to become more equal with the rest of society to well, have he certainly to brought us leaps forward leaps forward one individual and who took a, a negative circumstance and actually turned the tides for for you know millions of people his strategy was actually informed or um influenced or inspired by Gandhi's approach mm -hmm. in India, which to is the another British. great, great example. Like one man, the British ruled India for like something like 300 years, had India under their thumb. And while it wasn't entirely peaceful, uh, the revolution was largely led by Gandhi and based on the principle of ahimsa or nonviolence. Mm -hmm. 
and India got its country back. Mm -hmm. And if you go to India nowadays, you're like, whoa, the British were here. <laughs> like <laughs> You've told me that there's these these spots where there's like um crumbling buildings of British. Yeah, architecture. you can tell it's old British, but then it's like been engulfed in India, which if you've ever been to India is like it's a beast of its own. Yeah. Like but it's amazing. Dr. King like he was adamant on it and I, I can't remember who it was that, um, but I, I think one of his um, people uh, went, went to India to actually learn that the philosophy mm -hmm. of nonviolence and, and bring that back. Mm -hmm. But um, their camp, as opposed to um, Malcolm X and the, more of the other radical side who thought that like more that the, they weren't opposed to violent action. They felt like they needed to fight back. Yeah. But Dr. King King's camp was adamant that like nonviolence was essential to success and no matter what, no matter what they do. And uh, yeah, he was assassinated. And regardless of his own sacrifice, it, it, it what he did worked. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't know if it would have worked had it been violent. Probably you know? not. He Probably didn't, not. I mean, he we would firmly have believed put that the it thumb down have. even more. And but mm -hmm. because of the beauty of this man's soul, you know, and the choice he made again, it's like a trying circumstance. So so big tangent. But basically, it's like we just that's to me, that's like what liberation really is, is that we're no longer being drawn about by these lower impulses by by you know negative things that have happened to us i mean we we see some of the most beautiful radiant pure profound human beings come out of some of the most oppressive intense circumstances or conditions right we really do like they're like the the diamonds in the rough you know and there's something about when people have these experience of a, experiences of adversity and they recognize their power within the situation and they 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 um they become that lotus i mean one of the greatest examples you know in all of all over the the east is the symbology of the lotus flower it's one of the most beautiful flowers right and it grows in the muck and and that is the goal of human consciousness is that we flower into the purity of our being like we all hold this this beautiful sacred energy within us. Yeah. And regardless of our life circumstances, I mean, if we are incarnate in this realm, shit's going to happen. Like we don't get it. This isn't a, a, a f <laughs> like a get home free ticket. No, no, we, we came here. I truly believe we came here to work. And when I say work, I don't mean you know, nine to five, 24 hours. Soul work. I mean, soul work. We came here to work and we can try to avoid it. But I mean, you know, and again, this is my lens of belief. I don't think we get out of it. I think if no, we don't do I it agree. in this life, we're going to do it in the next. And if we don't do it in this dimension, we're going to do it in another and one. If and if we don't do it in this life, we're still going to suffer and we're probably going to suffer more. Yeah. And I mean, that that's my view is that um, there there is i don't i don't know what other word to use other than work but basically there there's a there are a set of lessons that that we need to learn as souls and to progress on our soul's path whether you believe in a soul or not um but i mean yeah you know use whatever linguistic terms or concepts you want but let's just talk about happiness i guess um if your goal is to be happy, which I think anyone can connect to, I, f I think that some of the strategies that people use for being happy are ineffective, like mm -hmm. in, in indulgence in the senses, for example. Like Absolutely. it's like, yeah, like sexual pleasure feels good. Um, food feels good. Or just sometimes you had a hard day and you want to have a couple drinks or you just want to check out on Netflix or you want to take some pills that make you don't feel anything. Okay, sure. But is that actually an effective strategy last. for being happy? Not really. No. So what is a more effective strategy? Well, I don't think we really have very effective strategies 
in that are baked into Western culture that actually bring us happiness. We're taught that um, we need stuff to be happy. We're, we're, a, we're I a mean, symptom. we're a cons- consumerist culture. Yeah, we're a symptom happy culture. We like to just put a band aid on the wound. We don't want to address where the wound came from in the first place. And uh, what I'm what I'm learning is that in order to actually get into like a deeper sense of happiness, more than just the rise and fall roller coaster ride of life of just like, oh, this thing happened to me and I'm happy or like when like achievement based happiness or success based happiness, Mm -hmm. there's a deeper internal happiness that comes from, I think a deeper acceptance of self, Mm -hmm. um, which involves loving yourself, which you know, can sound kind of corny, but like, it's about getting, getting deep into like a recognition of like, where are the place, what are the places that we judge in ourselves? Mm -hmm. What are the, Mm -hmm. what are we ashamed of? What are we guilty of? What are the things that happened to us that didn't feel good or were traumatic that still don't feel good to even think about or that we don't want to go back to? But like those are the gifts, those are the and gifts. Mm-hmm. there are, there are gifts that have like like yeah the benevolence of life everything is a gift. There are obvious gifts, things that feel good like oh this is a gift in my life, but th- there are gifts hidden that are wrapped up in trash packages. Totally. You know that you look at it and you're like mm, I don't want anything to do with that, but that's an aspect of your life in the external world or that's an aspect of your life in your internal world which usually it's and both <laughs> usually it's both but the internal stuff yeah. you carry that with you everywhere like yeah. they say everywhere you, you go f- there you are you can't run from it and you you can i mean there's a lot of people who they'll go their entire lives living in pain and they don't necessarily think about the painful aspects of themselves either their events or ways that they feel about themselves or treat themselves. They don't necessarily think about that on a daily basis or maybe they're so numb to it, but they carry that pain inside of them. And even those of us who are working on it carry that pain. I mean, there's yeah. there there's work to be done is, is what I mean. But I feel like that acknowledging that and being willing to do that work and make that commitment to doing that work and to be courageous because oh, yeah. it, takes it takes an immense of amount of courage to face our pain mm-hmm. and our pain at this point it's you know there's personal pain there's collective pain there's you know ancestral pain like we have a lot of density now and so to be able to face that and to be open to it and to be accepting of it and to let it move through us however it needs to to be released or to be like processed or digested it takes it takes some some <laughs> and and it doesn't sound fun and it doesn't feel good at first which is why i think people are so averted to it and why people try to get away from it but i think that it's important to share the gift in doing that work i think it's rewarding it it's is rewarding some of the most rewarding work <laughs> and i mean for for me, one uh, uh for you, tan- tantra has been a deep path for me. Medicine work and um, ayahuasca mm-hmm. has been yeah. a deep path as well as other paths. But nevertheless, these paths same 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 same. <laughs> and it's different methods of the same of the same achievements. I've had so many moments that of like. Like there's success in life when it's like, oh, um, I'm dating that girl that I wanted to date or I've been striving for this thing that I've achieved. There's like a high from that, but there's no high that compares to a deep personal breakthrough when like there's something that you have struggled with for a long time. Maybe it's like, depression maybe it's a fear maybe it's a fear of public speaking maybe it's it's something that has been holding you back in some way and to have the courage to confront that Mm -hmm. and to 
lift that burden off of your soul and off of your mind and off of your being and to be free of that. Free. And there's a yeah. moment and sometimes sometimes it's it's a moment that happens over time, but I've had moments like very tangible in ayahuasca ceremonies or in meditations, breakthrough moments. There's no feeling like that 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 really compares to the sort of life success high of that the soul liberation uh, and there's a lightness that comes with it and and like a bliss it's or like an a exuberance. whole expansion it's like all of a sudden our you, you know, create like a new I'm space about those, inside of again, yourself those sheaths it's like when something is lifted all of a sudden there's so much more space to perceive mm -hmm. and to experience and to you know it's and you get access to more of yourself yeah, absolutely and i've had experiences where i'm like when I open into that greater space within myself, when I release that burden and now I have access to more of myself, mm -hmm. I feel like more of myself yeah. in that moment, more than any other point in my life. It's like, I just got access to more of myself, which goes back to that question. Who am I? Right. I don't think you're talking about your ego self right now, right? No. Right. But so I mean, that's, and for me, that's, that's the, that's what the spiritual the path is. <laughs> it, it, the, for me, like I'm continually opening and awakening into who am I and liberating these aspects of myself that are locked, locked down into unawareness or mm -hmm. hidden behind pain or whatever. And that's, that's the, the beauty and the benefit and the gift of the spiritual path mm -hmm. and the healing path for me. Yeah. And like, that's why... I muster the courage to do it. And like, that's why it's worth doing. So worth doing. And yeah, it's hard and it's painful and it's really tough at times. But my feeling is that there's no, there is a choice, but really the choice is now or later. Do like, what's presenting itself, it's, right? It's, but it's work that has to be done. I really, and it, it's either, the choice is either avoid it or, go into it but like yeah. sooner or later you have to go into it and yeah it's difficult and painful at times to go into it but it's even more difficult and painful to avoid it mm -hmm. and at least by going into it and having the courage to face yourself and and get into it at least you can get through it and be free of it totally well when we're on our deathbed it's like what's real at that point you know if we've lived a life well and truly lived it means we've we've really shown up for everything that life has offered us to the mm. best of our ability which is going to waver you know there's going to be sometimes the best of our ability is going to be stellar and other times it's going to be like subpar that's okay that's whatever's real this is all about honoring what's real but then on our deathbed it's like we can we can have some peace all of those pieces that we ignore or skirt over or you know didn't complete it's, you know, so many people with like near death experiences have talked about the, the, the tape that rolls, you know, and, and, you know, the Tibetans talk about the different bardos that you go through after you die. It's like, we want to create as clean and beautiful of a slate. We want to leave behind us a legacy of beauty amidst, you know, some of the terrors of this realm. Mm. Like that to me, that's my sole impetus mm -hmm. is I want to leave beauty i want to walk in beauty wherever i go that's my goal hmm. and um to me that that's a very tantric goal and i want to um there were a couple of things i wanted to mention that came to me while you were talking and the first one just talking about uh these challenging things that come up as gateways i like to think of them as gateways they're thresholds that we're invited to cross over and through you know as we walk through life one of my greatest teachers um, this just always, it, it strikes such a chord in me, but she would always say that all of that is just showing us, it's the mere showing us what has not yet been freed into love. Hmm. And something about that, just thinking about that gets me through some of those harder places because then I'm like, oh, you know, okay, life is showing me this particular experience. What in me has not been freed into love yet? What is creating that like conflict with you know, this, this life situation or this negative situation. And that has been a huge grace in my life. Um, the other thing I wanted to 
talk about uh, was even more directly, as you were talking about that liberation and expansion and all that, the, the direct meaning of Tantra. <laughs> it's a two, two part word. Um, and I'm forgetting what exactly the tan, uh, the full Sanskrit for tan and tra is, but essentially tan means to expand, right? So we're expanding our capacity. Tra means to release or let go or liberate, right? Mm. So this is exactly what we're talking about. This is why Tantra, it's all inclusive. This is what's so powerful about the system. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your skin color is, what your sexual preferences are, what you know religion you follow. Like Tantra can literally, it's a system that can embrace everything, everything. And it's a system that liberates us. It allows us to expand into the truth of who we are and to liberate, to untie all of those knots that hold, keep us in bondage. Yeah. And it so, sounds so beneficial to have um, a, tr a tried and true ancient system to do that rather than just kind of like fumbling around on our own, trying to figure it out and mm -hmm. making all the rookie mistakes that, that we do. Like actually yeah. having these, uh, having some methods and practices and, um, and teachers like to, yeah. to have have guides in, in it too yeah because we can trick the ego's tricky we can trick ourselves into thinking you're doing the work and we're actually not that's called spiritual bypass <laughs> <laughs> and that happens um so it's nice to have that external mirror that that can see clearly and and can kind of point out when you're you know i think this is something that's really lacking in the west in spiritual traditions or spiritual people's spiritual journeys is accountability mm -hmm. you know like if we trust it's really hard when people point out our weak points you know like none of us really like that but how are we going to grow you know like what was so important about like sangha or like having you know, what's, what's really great about a system is you can have multiple people all following the same maps. You can have multiple people. It, it brings people together under a certain like umbrella of experience and, and shared experience. Um, and then you can start to hold each other accountable. Like how beneficial would it be? You know, and we're taught to be kind of nice and polite and, you know, so we don't necessarily say, hey, I, I noticed you do this thing <laughs> and... I'm wondering if you're aware of it and I'm wondering if you're aware of how it affects, you know, our relationship or, you know, you're, I, I'm seeing you keep doing this mistake over and over again and you're trying to get to this goal, but you keep sabotaging yourself, whatever it is. What would it, what would, what's a true ally look like? What does a true friend or partner, or, you know, parent even look like? You know, and, and how helpful would it be if people were able to reflect to us, if we were able to have that accountability? And then if we were brave enough also as we go on our journey to be like, hey, how am I doing? Like, mm. can you give me an honest reflection like of how I'm doing with this piece now? Because like, I've been doing this and this and this to work on it. So that's another thing that I think is lacking in our um on our spiritual journeys in this day and age because things do get so confused you know if we don't have a guru we can at least have allies on the journey and and maybe accountability buddies or something like that so we can stay on track and keep with our truth you know it's so often in relationship that the other sees us more clearly than ourselves right mm -hmm. and then the other will bring you know a lot of conflict that happens in relationship is one person seeing something they bring it up the other person doesn't take it well you know and it happens on both sides and it's like this ping pong match <laughs> but what if we were like what if we trusted other enough you know especially someone who's seeing us day to day especially this is another beautiful thing about that intimate relationship that so many of us are using tantra as a um as a kind of system to have intimate relationship within what if we actually trust that our partner might actually not be crazy and they might actually be observing something that we do and we're actually open to that idea and and can use relationship as a sacred crucible <laughs> of transformation mm -hmm. right it takes actually, a lot of humility <laughs> and have that aspect of service to each other totally and in, in, in being able to offer that right reflection. and to recognize 
that when our partner's offering us a reflection, they're not our enemy. That they're actually trying to serve us. They're trying to help us. And hopefully they're offering it from that place. Right, which doesn't always happen. So we have to practice on both sides. Yeah, yeah. we have to practice on both sides. Well, you know, we've been uh, chatting for over two hours. So we... I know it goes by so quick. And I mean, you and I have talked for like four hours straight. I know, totally. But before we close, I want to give you, an, I would like to, because you help people to get on the path with the the company that you started. So I want mm-hmm. to give you an opportunity to talk about um, your, your company, Shakti Temple Arts. Mm-hmm. And um, you, well, yeah, I'll let you go into it, but from, what I understand you help initiate women into the path, women in mm-hmm. particular, but, but women but in everyone. particular, but I do off also have co-ed offerings mm-hmm. that I do. Um, yeah. So, so the umbrella of my work is Shakti temple arts and basically, you know, again, if everything's Shakti <laughs> and we're trying to come back to that divine sacred space of life, uh, the temple (laughs) you know not just somewhere we have to go physically outside of ourselves but the temple within the temple you know if we see the whole planet as a temple and everything within it as sacred and as that invitation inward and then arts so these are uh, systems practices etc that can guide us into that experience right so that's kind of the basis of shakti temple arts and i'm i work in multiple lineages so i actually do work in the taoist lineage as well and i teach specifically the sexual energy cultivation in the taoist lineage and i teach that mostly for women at this point although i will be opening work to men as well in the future that seems to be being called for um and i think it's really important so we keep on that equal ground because that's what it's all about Um, And then I do offer work in the tantric field as well. And so that looks like that one I am doing more co-ed. And um, I do one offering periodically called the Shiva Shakti Puja, where we get to have that direct experience of working in mirrors, masculine and feminine with each other to achieve the actual direct experience of all these, this philosophical, philosophical stuff I'm sharing, right? Because again, mm-hmm. what is talk? It's it's nothing. It won't land. It won't stick if we don't have a direct experience. So that's one of my goals in my work is to give people direct experiences. Um, so I do that as an offering. Um, I work with people one-on-one, male and female. Um, I also, I lead, I have retreats around the world where we dive into these different arts. Also, uh, not so much lately with my knee, but sacred dance is a tantric path as well because it, that embodiment, that somatic, that devotional offering of sacred dance very much fits for me in that tantric window. So, um, so yeah, I have an international and online school that I hold a container for people to go into these systems and have direct gnosis of mm. them. Um, I also, I have an upcoming retreat in India, or not retreat, it's definitely not a retreat, a pilgrimage in India where we'll be going deep into uh, the tantric system through yoga, through some of the temple dance principles, through actual sadhana. We'll be learning how to worship the Sri Yantra properly. Um, Meanwhile, going to all of these sacred sites and really getting a super powerful direct transmission of of Tantra mm-hmm. through through, uh, you know, that seeker. So what is a pilgrim? It's like a seeker. So we're going we're actively putting our efforts into receiving particular experiences into going to places, offering ourselves openly and receiving whatever comes as a result of that. Um, so that's coming up and I'll also, I when do, is that? uh, that is in January, this coming January of 2019 and it's the 12th through the 26th mm-hmm. and there's more information on that on my website. So I'm not going to rattle off, but it's going to be a journey of a lifetime. It's also not for the faint of heart. Everything we've been talking about, um, India is a place of extreme paradox. You will see the most beautiful things you've ever seen you'll have the most beautiful experiences and you'll also have some really challenging experiences it's it's a uh speaking of karma being in india really accelerates our soul growth i i truly believe from many years spending there Mm -hmm. um so this journey is for those who are honestly ready to step into that cauldron of transformation through tantra what it really is which means 
we're holding the dark we're holding the light we're holding the masculine we're holding the feminine we are like getting committed to it. the path we're getting deep into it so it's yeah. this is a real deal journey um and it's open to men and women this particular offering cool. so i have that i have uh online courses so i have one currently that's that's um called the jade temple online initiation that's specifically for women uh, journey into the Taoist feminine arts, I call them. So sexual energy cultivation through that system. And I'm currently working on a new online course that I'm very, very, very excited about it, that will be in the tantric realms and it's called the Cosmic Consort. So it is about that love play, about these different pathways. Um, this one's also for women for now of uniting with the beloved through the form of our bodies or uniting with the formless beloved. So these different pathways to that and how we can use Tantra to have that kind of romantic experience of life. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and where can people find you, your website or website your... is best. You can find me on my website, which is www.shaktitemplearts.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Shakti Temple Arts and I have a Facebook page, Shakti Temple Arts. So shakti temple arts all around wonderful yeah. Yeah. wow we covered so much <laughs> everything that exists <laughs> everything so, i mean it this was so packed with information and like yeah like two hours and 15 minutes or something something crazy i'm gonna have to listen to this like a couple times i think do some editing <laughs> no it's oh. gonna be all uncut i don't cool. i don't edit anything um cool. unless people go to the bathroom i like to just have the conversation be the, in its full authentic form awesome. so it's, all of it's, it. it's all going out there great wonderful well such an honor yeah thanks so much yeah. and i'm sure we could have a, a, another conversation about different there's so many things that i wanted to talk about that we didn't get to just i'd love to talk more about like um how masculine and feminine plays out within mm -hmm. ourselves, within our personal relationships, mm -hmm. within our yeah. culture, and what's going on in our culture. There's a lot of things Ooh, to talk about. Okay, so. part two. Yeah, part two. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Thank Sweet. you, Halo. Thank you. Thanks again, Halo. If you want to reach out to me on social media, you can find me on Facebook at Chronicles of a Psychonaut. You can also find me on Instagram at Chronicles of a Psychonaut. And I'm much more active on Instagram. That's my main platform. So if you do want to reach out and give feedback or just reach out and say hi, just introduce yourself. Hi, listen to the podcast. Um, one of the reasons I started this podcast was to talk to cool people, but also just to expand myself into the community. And I imagine that the people who like my show are people that, would probably like me and that maybe I would like as well. Um, there's not very many of us in the broader society, I think, that talk about these kind of things. And so, yeah, I've appreciated the opportunity to just have a conversation um, just by DM or whatever and just get to ne just know that there's other people out there across the country and across the world. So don't be afraid to reach out. So I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, I um, have some rattles at my store. I want to show those to you real quick. These are, and if you are just listening, well, you can't see, but you can hear. And so I just have, they're small little rattles made from gourds. This one has a dolphin on it. And this one has a bird on it. And I use these in um, ceremony. Uh, for singing medicine songs, not these particular ones, but I have my own and they just have a beautiful sound and a beautiful feel to them. They're made of natural materials and I also have these little little egg shaped ones. And I want to show you too, this is a piece of Moldavite. So you can see it's this translucent green glass. It's crazy looking in it. I don't know if the camera can see, but it has, it's, it has all these crazy ripples on the surface. So again, if you want to check out my store, the link is in the description, or you can go to etsy.com slash shop slash infinity within to find my stuff. And so I'm not sure which episode I'm going to do next week. I have a couple people lined up. I haven't been announcing next week's episode because I actually just haven't known. I'm really just recording episodes 
the week of and releasing them. So one thing I will do eventually is just do some solo episodes because I have tons of crazy stories of my own. I've been enjoying hearing other people's stories, but at some point I'm going to share my stories as well. And I think the first one I'm going to do is called That One Time I Teleported. And that has to do with a seven gram dried psilocybin mushroom journey that I did where I don't know if I actually teleported, but I definitely had the experience of teleporting, of all of a sudden being in one place and then being in another place instantaneously. The other place was about 100 yards away, not super far, but I may have teleported. I was really, really high and super interdimensional. It was crazy. So who knows? Maybe that'll come out next week. It's going to come out sometime. So anyway, thanks for listening to the show. Appreciate you guys. See you next week.